We are recording. All right. Do it thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. Welcome to the second law oasis is Kabbalah 101. I'm Thora Dale and this Sor Lucy. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm glad everyone is here this evening. Um, quick disclaimer as usual. Uh, the uh, if you can uh, <laughs> make a five dollar five to ten dollar donation, it would be awesome. Uh, again, the class is free, but if you can make a donation, it helps us continue offering these events in the future. It supports um, the ability to do the outdoor events that uh, we're doing. It, it, so, uh, it allows for us to keep paying rent even though we are not able to be in our space yet, hopefully in the future, uh, that will uh, happen soon, sooner than later. Um, it's been a long time, so it'd be nice to start doing our mass again. Um, but that being said, that's where we uh, generate a lot of our income. And, and so if you can make a donation, that's great. If not, enjoy the free class, and we're glad that you're joining us tonight. Uh, the other thing is uh, I may not produce or uh, pronounce Hebrew the way you do. I may say things that you don't agree with. Um, the great thing about that is that's okay. You know, we all will we'll live through it, and <laughs> if I ruffle your feathers, you're welcome. You know, not really, but uh, hopefully every. I don't offend you, but if I do, it was not intentional. Um, but I, and I also wanna say that we are learning just like you, we're students of, of Kabbalah and it's just something we happen to enjoy. And that's why we do these classes. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know and I'll look it up and I will find out. Um, tonight we're doing the 27th Path of Pay. So, may as well get started. There you go. <laughs> All right. The 27th path is also called the exciting intelligence. Uh, through it is, this is from the Sefer Yetzer, through it is created the breath of every creature under the supreme orb, as well as the motion of them all. So, I always start off with uh, what the Sefer Yetzirah says. It's the one-liner explaining um, this mode of consciousness um, that's represented by the Hebrew letter Pei. Um, and it's that was an interesting one, meditating on that, uh, because what I what I got out of it, I think it it was indicative of prana. Uh, it not only um, through it is created the life breath of every creature under the supreme orb, as well as the motion of them all. I think it was that's really indicative of the energy that is um, brought in both through the mouth and um, I believe it is in the uh, Indian tradition, the yogi tradition, the back of the neck, just opposite of the mouth, as a matter of fact, uh, is called the mouth of God, and that's where uh, prana enters our. Um, our energy body, if you will. Um, that's not taught in ours, but that's just a correlation um, with it. So, which I like both of them and it entertain the idea. Um, pay means the mouth. Uh, the Hebrew letter for is, uh, is mouth. And um, that fits really well, especially if you know what the image of the, the, the tower card is it's it's joining this the seventh and the eighth sephira and it's shown uh um, i don't know if everybody's got got their card out but i don't know if you can see it anyway so, from mine so i won't even try uh but it shows the mouth issuing fire and kind of destruction and and uh, and it, and it's it talks about the fact that um it represents the mouth and particularly as the organ of speech. Um, and the mouth, what comes out of the mouth can be really destructive. It can be very um, fiery. It can be very insightful. 
exciting again, the exciting intelligence. Uh, and also it, it represents fire. Um, I don't, some of you were here for Sheen, uh, quite a couple of you anyways, at least. And, uh, and that was tooth. So it kind of has a, a similar process of the tooth and that fire too. Um, the mouth also is a, a organ that, that digests, it, it, that begins a digestion process, the breaking down of material things and changing its form into an energy that's usable for us, an energy that is um, readily available for the body to turn into higher consciousness. It's the way we would absorb uh, sacred sacraments like um, cakes of light or, um, or Eucharist in general, um, any form of that, um, of taking an object, making that object sacred and ingesting that object in order to share the sacredness of that, um, of your deity within yourself. Um, that's what magic is purely about. Uh, and it, at least a large part of it is making things sacred and then making yourself sacred via those instruments or those uh, elements, if you will. Um, let's see what else on my note right there. Uh, it represents uh, the tower card itself. Uh, it represents Mars. Um, so it's one of the uh, planetary influences. So that means it's a double letter. It has a double meaning, it has a double, double sound. Um, the north face of the cube of space is represented by the tower card. So in the northern hemisphere, if you were to build your cube, the whole square would be red and that would be opposite of the orange side of the cube, which would be in the south and that one would be happen to do with the sun. Uh, the letter connecting those would be sheen. Um, another element, the fire element, we just talked about that. Um, let's see, the next step. Maybe I'll do it from here. Okay, great. Perfect. So I could have clicked on that when I was <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about everybody being able to see the card. Well, there it is. Um, the, uh, talk about the kings, uh, the, the color scales now, the color scales uh, in the king color scale would be scarlet. Um, and then in the queen, it would be red. The prince would be Venetian and the princess would be bright red, red azure or emerald. Um, and so if you're ever designing a ritual, that's why I always bring the color scales up you would start in absolute, and you would work your way down in order for it to, into manifestation in the world of Asia, which is the final, the princess scale. Um, and so in this one, you can see that this one is, it doesn't have a lot of the princess. It does have uh, the, the prince scale, a lot of it, a lot of the scarlet and the red. So um, Lady Frida Harris uh, really put, put the red in that one. Um, there's some cool symbolism in there. There's the lion and the serpent. There's the dove um, and the dove being in there because it's where it's headed. Uh, it, it's a symbol of Venus and it's, uh, that's what it's linking. It's linking Ahod at, to Netzach. It's one of the first uh, horizontal ladders as well. One of, there's uh, three, three places where there's a straight across the tree. Um, from the pillar of severity to the pillar of mildness. And that pillar of severity would, if you turn the card on its side, kind of matches like where that force and fire is pushing towards the bright light at the end of the tunnel, which would be the representative of the eye, at least in my my mind. So. And doesn't it have like the, like in the, the zigzag of the lightning that's coming down the tree kind of going behind it, is that kind of, what that mm -hmm. is representing back yeah, there? Yeah, no, most definitely. Yeah, the, the flaming sword, it's called. Yeah. Uh, the flaming sword of creation, the descent of energy that uh, basically zigzags down the tree. And yes, that is exactly 
Fantastic. Yeah, I really enjoy like uh, I I'm new to the uh, Thoth tarot and tarot in general, but I really enjoy um, seeing like the other symbols in uh, Kabbalah come up and in recognizing them in in the tarot um, and and kind of have getting a better understanding of what those things mean uh, can be can be an interesting um, eye opener. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's the 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 O God in there, the octagon as well, another symbol uh, behind the, the uh, tower, uh, that would be another symbol of Hode and, and the, the change of that Hode across, once you are going across that plane from Hode to Netzach. Uh, both of them are on the fifth plane, um, left and right. Uh, so that's sharing that space. All right, next. Uh, if you were to spell pay, um, you would do it like that uh, with uh, with a, the Hebrew letter pay and the uh, Hebrew letter a. Oh, sorry, hey, <laughs> pay hey, uh, or p. And the Hebrew it can be pronounced with a hard p, or it can be like a ph, like um, like I can only think of fake words right now, like fat or fish. PH, uh, phonics would be one of the ways. Physics. Physics, yeah. <laughs> or uh, people uh, would be another hard pronunciation. There's a hard and a soft, and the hard would be the sound, and the PH would be the, the soft sound of the letter. Um, the other, the esoteric title of, of the tower card is the house of God, the mighty house of God, I believe. Um, pay hey equals 85. Uh, if you want to look at the gematria, um, pay itself as the Hebrew letter, uh, equals 80, or as a final letter, it equals 800. Um, again, playing with gematrias, um, the final letters, you know, that's, uh, they're, they don't always use them when they're figuring out gematria. Um, but sometimes they do because it works out the way you, you, you just work at it long enough. You can make it the way you want it usually. And that, that was another way to finish up the scale up to a thousand. So they added the five Hebrew letters, uh, and put final, uh, uh, final numbers to make it up to a thousand, 900, I believe so. Okay. Um. There you're seeing a lot of the common attributions for this uh, uh, for this um, letter, uh, which would be the horse, the bear, the wolf, uh, rubies, uh, particularly any red stone, but specifically rubies. Um, the pentagram, uh, that's relating back to the fact that this card represents Mars. Um, and so, uh, even when we were doing the class, uh, when we were setting up all of our um, slides and everything, uh, Vanessa or, or Sir Lucy had um, recognized, isn't that the same divine name? And I was like, yes, it is because of the simple fact of, because when we did last, we did, um, but, no, we did, the emperor, yes, yeah, sorry. Zadi. Yeah. And, and the emperor, and the emperor's uh, ruled Mars, rules Aries, and Aries uh, is the card associated with the emperor, or Aries is the zodiacal sign associated with the emperor, and the emperor key is the one we did last, um, which was Zadi. And also, so a lot of the uh, symbolism is the same because of that link between. Um, Mars. So, and Mars rules Aries by day and Scorpio by night. So, another little detail. Um, it also is, uh, it's incense is dragon's blood, pepper, blood, or all things hot and are all hot, pungent, odors. Mm -mm. 
good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Uh, but uh, the, the body pro problem that would show up um, would be uh, inflammation. Uh, the metal itself, it would be iron. There again, all of these are associated with Mars. Um, the chakra is the Svaristana or the prostatic ganglion, your, uh, where the sexual force comes from. Um, and, yeah. um, as far as the seven holy sacraments of old time, um, the one would be penance, or you'd get your what for, and uh, your, your little correction to make it all well in the world again. Um, which in some respects, those things are, uh, you know, we're always a, a terrible thing. I think there's a, a spot for, um, I don't know, a level of correction as far as where we're at. And um, certainly not in the way that it has been, um, um, been developed in, the, especially in the church, but there are ways that we can uh, kind of give ourselves little corrections, like I, what I'm thinking of is like library Gorum or um, different things where we learn to control ourselves by an act of, of uh, penance, really from a better or, you know, lack of a better term, um, a correction of some kind in order to, to learn a level of control over ourselves and a level to make our our mind the servant and not the master. Um, so, like I said, I think that's why I included it. It seemed reasonable. So the divine name in Asiya is Elohim Gabor, and that is where uh, that I was just babbling about it being the same for um, the emperor because it was Elohim Gabor for that as well. Um, Adonai is another um, divine name as well for this the archangel is Kamael, uh, the planetary angel is Zamael, and going back to uh, the last class, there was a, a question of Makadael, and, you know, it's not very commonly used, but it is the archangel of Aries, and uh, in, in um, 777, it's listed under the geomantic intelligences, and in Godwin's, it was straight up the Archangel of Aries. So, mm -hmm. and in seven, seven, six and a half, it was awesome. where, yeah, I found that originally. And, and it was Archangel of Asia is what that said for the 28th path. So, like I said, if I didn't know, I would look it up and I looked it up and, and I verified it in multiple sources. So. Um, let's see. spirit Bartzabel, planetary intelligence Graphael. Looks like my internet connection is going unstable for a minute, so I might lose it. or at least be chattery, but hopefully it stays fine. Uh, the Egyptian god would be Horus for us Thelemites, the beloved Ra or Kuits, Hindu god Krishna and Durga. Greek god Ares and Athena, Roman god would be Mars, and of the seven churches of old times, it is Smyrna. I'm sorry, let me get this out of the way. Okay, good. Okay. All right, okay. and just another quick honoring of the beautiful painting by Kat Leno. Uh, she has a beautiful painting of Ra Horkui. And um, yeah, she's all of her paintings are just so vibrant and they have an energy emanating out of them that is like, I don't know, palpable. Every time I walk by it in the hallway, it's like, oh, hello. 
Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just I so. think it's a good spot too, because it's like when you wake up, it, you're just kind of like, oh, the day, and then you're like, oh, the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, look her up if you, if you enjoy art and flame card in general. She does pretty amazing work. The sword is the magical weapon. Uh, magical weapon is. You know, when you think about a sword, what does a sword do? It, uh, <laughs> well, it in, could intimidate, but it's really, it's something that divides. It's it's something that separates. Um, it is something that concentrates. It's it's a, you can think about it as a concentrator of will, a, a an example of taking all of that energy and putting it into one spot. Um, the, the, the tip or the point of the sword, um, you know, Crowley has, goes on quite a bit about the sword. Uh, I didn't write any or go along or uh, in, include any of that this time. Um, but there, if you're interested, there's a lot in uh, the blue, the big blue brick about the sword itself. Mm-hmm. So, but it is effective and um, definitely a powerful magical weapon. So the things that are associated with the magic, the magical power associated with it, uh, works of wrath and chastisement, <laughs> vengeance and destruction of thoughts. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I found this slide, uh, sort of loose did, and uh, I thought that it was very fitting, pretty funny. Uh, you get your chastisement and your, uh, you know, your work of wrath and, your vengeance all together in a funny little meme. <laughs> um, but what I do like about that is the destruction of thoughts. Um, again, a little bit of what I was talking about a little while ago, um, during, like using the library you go on, or um, whatever method that uh, we choose to, um, choose to utilize in order to learn to control those, those random thoughts that are not what we want at the moment. It's not what we're directing. Again, the symbol of the sword, um, it's another example of, of not this, but that. Discrimination mm-hmm. um, and destruction of thoughts is an exam- advanced proce- process that is past not even um, thinking about them, but actually just des- destroying that thought before they get before it even comes out um, well we did that one exercise we were meditating and uh visualizing using a sword to destroy the distracting thoughts like as they came up into your into the part of your brain where thoughts kind of come into and are present you know before they get there you just like slice them and uh envisioning that was like super helpful and, and it was a really great uh exercise to help with like um when meditating and like your daily life starts to try and pop in and whatever. Uh, it was a fun way to, to, to kind of get rid of those thoughts and, and just like slice them. And I, I don't know, I got a kick out of it. So. <laughs> it's effective. Yeah. So um, developing discrimination and developing the ability to allow uh, the thoughts we want apart from the thoughts we do not want as a tool that I think we'll be working on for a long time, at least for myself, I'll be, that's a forever process for me. Um, you know, because again, like we've talked about in other ones, when we're talking about the subconscious aspect of, of like the negative self-talk type of situations, um, the, the belittling of, of yourself and the, you know, the, all of those things that uh, almost run on autopilot and a kind of continual loop, oh, you dumbass, you know, this and that, or, you know, we, we chastise ourselves, at least I do um, quite a bit, and something that uh, work at changing. So, anyways, enough about that. So I talked about the fact that it had a double meaning. Uh, there's, uh, for the double letters, there's usually a, a double meaning. Um, this one is a little uh, <laughs> odd, ugliness and grace. Um, 
so yeah that it I don't have a lot on that one i yeah it's kind of an odd one the other ones are easier peace and strife war and you know fruitfulness and sterility but this one is ugliness and grace so take it for what it is and you know grain of salt uh double letter planet went over the sound already so magical formula Aleph Gimel Lamed Aleph so it's Agla um and so that's it's a noterikon um it's uh Ata Gabur Leolam Maranai was what um what that stands for so um, if you are familiar with the pentagram ritual, uh, that is what is vibrated um, in the north. Uh, some people just use the notericon uh, and uh, vibrate Hagla. Um, I personally like to, to uh, say what it, what it represents. Um, but that's just the way I was taught. And if you do it with Hagla, it's great. So there's the talisman, uh, or you can visualize a spear if you like, uh, however you wanna do that. The talisman, uh, you'll be asked in the path working to present it. So um, if you wanna wear that around your neck, or if you want to physically visualize having a spear at your uh, convenience um, to count along with you, um, however you wanna do that, uh, that's the magical key to accessing the 27th path that we will be doing here shortly. Um, those are all of the, the sources that utilized for images. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Does anybody need to get up, um, do anything, go to the bathroom real quick? Or Sounds like I will be doing we have, that. <laughs> we, have a, we have a bathroom volunteer, so if you need to go ahead and do that and get comfortable. Uh, it, it's not super long, but um, it's fairly long. Yeah, it's a, it's a longer one, so um, just kind of focus on the breath at first and just follow the, the meditation like usual. And Angel, the, this is where we can, we're going to do a path working, uh, which is really a guided meditation. It's just, uh, so just listen and um, relax. And I'll take little breaks during the readings. Um, and that'll be so that you have a, <clears throat> a chance to have, let your guide take over and let your guide to... Um, Kind of fill in the blanks of of the space so uh if you hear me take a blank maybe my internet connection went out but more than likely that i'm just giving it a break so that you can formulate your own um, path working uh, thank you yeah and i think everybody else are pretty seasoned and been here justin i think you've been to quite a few now so i think you've got it down as well. Uh, so I'll do a banishing tonight. Um, and you keep, there you go. Got that. For some yeah. reason, it's really zoomed in and I, I can't see the pay on the top, but I don't know why. <laughs> okay. So, a little technical difficulty, a little bit on that one. So, we're cutting the pay off on. I might be able to, I mean, I don't know if it. You guys, either way, does it matter? I think it's okay at this okay. point because what we're focusing on is the card, and um, yeah, that's it's zoomed in oddly, but yeah, <clears throat> <laughs> so just go ahead and start relaxing and taking a deep breath. I'm going to do a quick banishing for us, uh, and since the uh, the magical imp or the magical um, talisman and the gate is a spear, I'm gonna go ahead and use my spear itself to do my vanishing today so i have to make sure not to knock anything over oh 
Before me, Raphael. Behind me, Gabriel. At my right hand, me. Before me flames the pentagram, within me shines the six-rayed star. Go ahead and kind of get yourself relaxed. Start to take a really deep inhale breath and then exhale with a sigh. Like, oh. Again. Oh. Feel your body becoming relaxed with every breath. Breathe in to a count of four. Hold for a count of four. Exhale for a count of four. Stay empty for a count of four. Inhale to a count of four. Hold for a count of four. Exhale to a count of four. Stay empty for a count of four. Inhale to a count of four. Hold for a count of four. 
Exhale for a count of four. Stay empty for a count of four. Inhale to a count of four. Hold for a count of four. Exhale to a count of four. Stay empty for a count of four. Inhale to a count of four. Hold for a count of four. Exhale for a count of four. Stay empty for a count of four. Now allow the breath to return to normal. Making sure to do deep diaphragmatic breathing, but no longer control its pace. We're gonna sit for a couple of more minutes. Watch the breath go in. And the breath goes out. The breath goes in. And the breath goes out. Follow this on your own for a little bit. Consciously, as a mantra, following the breath in and follow the breath out. Behind the darkness of your closed eyelids, you begin to visualize the astral temple of the Sephira of Malkuth. As your journey begins, the ten-sided chamber of Malkuth appears around you. As on previous journeys, you intone the names which call forth the inhabitants of the temple. Adonai Hararetz. Sandalfan. Hashi. Sandalphon comes forth and you exchange the sign of the enterer and she answers with the sign of silence. When she asks why you have entered her abode, you hold up the spear. Swiftly, the archangel leads you through the portal in the sheen, the sheen, the portal of sheen in the northeast of the temple and up the 31st path to the Temple of Hod. Leaving Sandalphon, you enter the water temple, giving the projection sign of the enter. Once inside, you give the sign of silence. Once again, you are in the octagonal temple of Hod. The walls are draped in curtains of orange silk. The floor is encrusted with fire opals in the shape of an octagon. And the ceiling is ornamented with the sigil 
of mercury and the figure of a cup. On the blue altar in the middle of this sacred chamber covered by an apron is the familiar disc of opal containing the temple flame, the chalice of water in the book of knowledge engraved with the figure of an octogram. To announce your presence in the temple and call forth its inhabitants. You call forth Elohim Sabaoth Mikhail Beni calling the Archangel Mikael in the order of angels known as the Ben Elohim. Mikael appears just as you remember him, a swarthy, robust figure in robes of orange with a blue octogram emblazoned across his chest. Great blue and orange wings grace his muscular shoulders. Tucked under one arm is a book. He speaks. Behold the vision of splendor and the reflection of mercy. By what simple symbol dost thou herein enter? By the martial symbol of the spear. Satisfied, the archangel takes you to the right side of the chamber and draws back a portion of the orange drapery to reveal a red archway bearing a white letter, pay on its keystone. Within the arch is a veil with the tarot image of the tower painted on it. Mikhail traces the symbol of Mars and the veil fades into a mist. In its place is a door carved from pure ruby. You hold up the spear and trace the letter pay before the door which dissolves. Stepping through the por portal, you enter the path of pay. Notice what it feels like. Is it hot? Do you hear anything? What does it smell like? You find yourself immersed in that kind of void or vacuum a nebulous black gray area of darkness and silence. You hear the voice of Mikhail as he narrates an ancient drama. Ere the eternal instituted the formation, beginning and end existed not. Therefore, before him, he expanded a certain veil and therein he instituted the primal kings. And these are the kings who reigned in Edom before there reigned a king over Israel. But they subsisted not. When the earth was formless and void, behold, this is the reign of Edom. And when the creation was established, lo, this low reign of Israel, and the wars of titanic forces in the chaos of creation. Lo, these are the wars between them. From a light bearer of unsupportable brightness proceeded a radiating flame, hurling forth like a vast and mighty hammer. Those sparks which were the primal worlds and these sparks flamed and scintillated a while 
but being unbalanced, they were extinguished. Since lo, the kings assembled, they passed away together, and these be the kings of Edom, who reigned before there reigned a king over Israel. The grayness fades away, and the vision changes, and you see before you a mass of still black water, darker than any water you have ever seen. You feel alone in an alien world. Mikael continues. From mankind's oldest writings, the following legend is revealed. In the earliest times when the sky above had not been named and the earth below was nameless, there existed only Apsu, the sweet waters of the primordial abyss the ocean which circled the universe, and Tiamat, the salty, tumultuous sea. Then there was a stirring in the waters. The waters mingled, and from their mingling came the first ones, Lamu and Lahamu, the essence of male and female, who gave birth to Anshar and Kisar, the masculine heavens and the feminine earth. To Anshar and Kisar were born the great gods Anu, the god of heaven, and Ea, the god of wisdom, and the many younger gods. You see before you a stirring in the primordial waters of darkness, like swirling clouds of mud in the bottom of a pond. In the middle of this commotion, you see two serpentine shapes developing one thread of light and the other a thread of darkness. The two threads entwine each other like the serpents on the Caduceus wand of Hermes. Then both disappear into the cloudy waters. In their place, you see a disk surrounded by the waters of the abyss. It is the essence of the terrestrial world, ringed with mountains, on which rests the vault of the heavens. The narrative of Mikael continues. The primordial gods were deities of darkness and disorder. The younger gods were deities of light and order. The ways of the younger gods were foreign to the old gods of chaos and silence. Apsu, the ancient one, declared that there would be no peace for him as long as the newcomers dwelt in the heavens making noise with their thunder, their arguments, their laughter, and their lovemaking. His mate, Tiamat, the water dragon of chaos, agreed and vowed to make war on the younger gods. She made elaborate plans to destroy the gods of order. These wars of titanic forces and the chaos of creation, lo, these are the wars between them. The cloudy water swirls violently and the scene before you fades into darkness. You find yourself in a magnificent heavenly palace high above the skies of the earth. You are in the presence of the celestial de deities of ancient Mesopotamia. 300 in all, there is Baal, the lord of the storm and king of the land, Ea, the god of knowledge and wisdom, and their companion goddesses, Belit and Damkina. Shamash, the this god of the sun and Sin, the god of the moon, are also part of the assembly as well as the great goddess Ishtar. In the eastern part of the palace is the great golden throne, on either side of which are the stone figures of winged bulls seated on that throne is Anu, the god of power and justice. 
supreme sovereign of heaven, who holds court in this celestial hierarchy. He is a mature, bearded figure with horn diadem of royalty and holding the staff of command. His dark eyes convey great wisdom and authority. The God raises his hand for silence and a hush settles over the crowd. Anu speaks, be silent, war is upon us. Even now Tiamat seeks revenge against us and plots our destruction. I would hear what my brother Ea, the wise, has to say. Ea, the god of wisdom, steps forward. He leans heavily on his crook as he relays the bad news to Anu and the assembly of gods. Long ago, I heard Apsu plan to destroy us and return to the heavens and the earth to chaos and oblivion. To defeat him, I cast a potent and holy spell a powerful invocation. I recited the words and sent them into the deep, into the realm of Apsu, and he fell into a deep and soundless sleep. Finding him thus, I went to the realm of Apsu. I bound and slaughtered both he and his advisor. Having defeated our enemies, I established my dwelling upon the waters of Apsu. I named my abode Apsu, and in my sacred chamber, I found peace. There my wife, Damkina, and I dwelt in splendor, in the heart of Apsu, in the chamber of fates, in the abode of destinies, a god was engendered, my son, whom you know today as Marduk. Wisest and most powerful of us all, I rejoiced at his birth and I raised him to perfection. I endowed him with a great with greatness, my son is the son of the heavens. But on the day that I killed Apsu, his mate, the dragon Tiamat, was enraged. She swore vengeance against all the younger gods. Tiamat gathered up a certain number of gods who rallied to her cause. From the waters of the great deep, she summoned forth the most fearsome monsters to form her army. They march at the side of Tiamat in rage. They plot without ceasing night and day. They are set for combat, growling and raging. She has appointed her consort, Kingu, to lead her army. My father, Anshar, is distressed. He sent me to kill Kingshu, Kingu, just as I killed Apsu before him. But Tiamat protects her commander with a powerful magical spell. I cannot defeat him. We must elect a mighty champion who will vanquish our enemy. Showing concern, the god Anu speaks. Our father Ansar went, sent me to speak with the great dragon to assuage her anger and abate her wrath. But Tiamat cannot be reasoned with. I cannot defeat her. We must elect a mighty champion who will vanquish our enemy. Ea the wise spoke up. Our father, Anshar, has chosen our avenger. I summon my son, Marduk, mightiest of all. Marduk, who makes my heart swell with pride. Marduk, the most powerful of heroes, whose strength is outstanding, whose onslaught is past resisting. My son, who is the son of heavens, Marduk shall be our champion. The assembly of gods agreed. Marduk, they cry. Marduk will be our champion. The crowd parts as a tall and powerful figure strides forward to approach the throne. Clothed with a halo of ten gods, Marduk addresses Anu. And when he opens his mouth to speak, fire issues from his lips. I will go and attain thy heart's desire. But if I am to vanquish Tiamat and save your lives, then set up the assembly, proclaim my destiny to be supreme. Be glad and rejoice. You shall soon tread upon the neck of Tiamat. 
The gods rejoice in their champion, then Marduk is set on the throne of heaven. He is made sovereign over all the gods, even over Anu. They prepare a banquet in his honor and declare him king of the gods. They present Marduk with the royal vestments and weapons. They prayed to him who was the greatest of them all. O oh Lord, they cry, we have granted you kingship over the entire universe. Your weapons shall not fail. They shall smash your foes, O oh Lord. Spare the life of those who trust you. But pour out the life of the God who seized evil. May the winds carry her blood to secret places. The banquet scene before your eyes fades. Now find yourself in the center of a celestial battlefield in the heavenly abyss of Apsu. From the deep waters of the darkness and chaos, Tiamat's army pours forth to destroy the gods of light. Hideous monsters of all descriptions make up her dreadful horde. Gigantic venomous serpents with poison for blood. Huge dragons who can roast their foes with a mere glance. Enormous savage dogs with shark-like teeth. Creatures which they are part of human, part human, part scorpion, and countless other horrible beasts. They pour out of the abyss in a rage, berserk with bloodlust. Their combined screams culminate in a low, frenzied roar that is absolutely alien to human ears. At their end is Kingu, the commander-in-chief, protected by Tiamat's magic and armed to the teeth with sharp weapons. The she-dragon herself is at his side, her scaly body still wet from the watery abyss and flames darting from her eyes and nostrils. Her awful roar is enough to terrify all but the bravest of gods. From the abode of light, Marduk enters the battlefield in a chariot. He is flanked by his father gods, the rulers of fate and destiny and various deities of storm. Like a golden winged cherub, the mighty king of the gods faces the evil host of darkness. A halo of fire illuminates this, his regal figure. Dressed for battle, he is a beautiful and terrible to look at. Flashes of lightning brighten the path before him, and with every step, you hear a clap of thunder. His passing produces hailstones the size of boulders. He carries in his right hand a great bow and in his left a heavy mace. A quiver of arrows hangs at his side. He advances on Tiamat, rebuking the she-dragon for her wickedness and challenging her to single combat. Rearing up on her hindquarters, the chaos dragon hurls a series of powerful magical spells at her adversary. A lesser god would have been incinerated but Marduk does not even flinch. He casts a great net over Tiamat, trapping her. He stations the four winds around her in the east, the west, the north, and the south. Then he throws an evil wind, a deadly hurricane, into her face. The dragon bellows in rage and attempting to swallow the god whole. As she does so, Marduk forces the lethal winds down her throat. As Tiamat chokes on the evil wind, Marduk shoots an arrow into her heart. With a roar of pain, the dragon falls on her side, the ground shaking beneath her. Marduk raises his club, and with one mighty blow, he shatters the dragon's head. And responding to the cheers of joy from the gods of light, the victorious god stands over the body of the slain dragon. The death of Tiamat spreads confusion through the ranks of her followers. The dark gods who had aided her tremble with terror. In disarray, they flee to try to save their lives, but they are quickly surrounded and taken prisoner. Panic-stricken and one of the venomous 
serpent slithers towards you to escape the wrath of Marduk. You hold up the spear to threaten it and stamp heavily on the monster's head. In the divine name, Elohim, Yibor, Lord of hosts, stand. The demon flees from you to join the rest of the captives. From Kingu, the commander of the evil host, Marduk takes back the stolen tablets of destiny. Then the victorious one orders that Tiamat's army be put into chains and cast into the infernal regions. The gods of light see that this is done, but Tiamat's commander is ordered to remain. Then while the gods sing his praises, Marduk contemplates what to do with the dragon's body. He decided to create orderly works of art from the carcass of chaos. He splits the body of the chaos dragon in two, filleted like a fish. With one half, he fashions the vault of the heavens, and from other, he creates the earth. Next, he divides the upper waters from the lower waters to make dwelling places for the gods Anu, Baal, and Ea, and give them the constellations as their images. He sets his bow and his net into the heavens as, constel as constellations also. Then he institutes the yearly cycle of the earth and establishes the rule of the moon by the night and the rule of the sun by the day. The waters of chaos recede as the universe comes, from in comes into being, the planets, the stars, and the galaxies. From Tiamat's saliva, he formed the clouds and filled them with water. From her crushed skull, he created the mountains. From her eyes, he established the ancient rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. From her arteries, he formed the streams and the lakes. The younger gods rejoice in, at Marduk's great victory. They bring him all manner of gifts and light. King of all the gods and patron of the sanctuaries, they swear the allegiance to the new champion and promise to carry out his commands. Marduk speaks to the assembly. In Apsu, I have built the abode of the gods. Below you, I have formed the stable earth. I shall create a new race called man from the blood of Kingu, Tiamat's rebel. Then man will honor and serve the gods. I have brought light into the world. I've hardened the ground for a building site. Here I will build a house to be my splendid abode. I will found a temple there to establish my authority and to receive the assembly of the gods. They descended from the heavens. I will call my house Babylon, the house of the great gods. You are relieved that Marduk was able to defeat Tiamat and pave the way for all the seekers of light and balance. It is your victory as well, for you shiver to think what might have happened had chaos triumphant over order. Eternal darkness would have reigned supreme and humanity might have never come into being. Your final image of Marduk is a kingly figure surrounded by a halo of golden light and an entourage of adoring gods. The vision of the Babylon and its ancient deities fades away. You are now left with one final image, the tree of life. You see the 10 Sephiroth, the vessels that were strong enough to contain the light of the divine. 
knowing that this is our path. This is our way to attain Godship. Our way to attain the level of Marduk. Our way to serve ourselves. Our way to develop our divine will. Our way to find that force. It is now time to leave the path of pain. Sit for a moment in your own vision of this path before you return. Spend just a couple of minutes. Look for symbols. Look for signs. Listen for instruction. Something to take back with you. Take a moment and express your gratitude for any guide that may have came to Mikhail, to the letter pay. Which represents your holy guardian angel. Acknowledge that fact. And now turn and head back towards the temple of Hod. You're reluctant to leave this place of learning, but you know what you have accomplished today. It's going to take time to fully comprehend. Again, thank our, the Archangel Mikael and descend the path of Sheen to the temple of Malkuth. Sandalfon welcomes you and seals the portal of the 31st path behind you. She brings a chalice of water to give you a long, cool drink from the fountain. The Ashim are quite noticeable in the temple after your journey onto the path of pay. They resemble yodes of flame dancing above the altar. You enjoy their company a while before leaving. Finally, you bid goodbye to the inhabitants of the temple. Salute once again with the sign of the enter. Sandalfon gives the sign of silence. And you return to the symbol yourself to help you come back into your earthly temple. Give yourself the sign of silence. Touch your lips with your right forefinger. Allowing that to be a sealing of your vehicle back into your physical body.
And if you feel like it, uh, we're going to again give the sign of silence, pressing your finger against your lips and cry out, Apopontos Cacodiminos. Apopontos Cacodiminos. Apopontos Cacodiminos. A simple and effective banishing to make sure it's just you that came back. No, no hanger honors. Um, and then welcome back. Okay. Okay. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, another quick reminder of the fact that um, if you can make a donation, that'd be awesome. Five to ten dollars is more than generous, and. Um, Glad we're here and we're, we'll talk off of uh, when we stop recording, but um, love is a law, love under will.